What's up, everyone? Welcome to the dark room where two blind cinephiles illuminate the sighted. I'm Lee Pugsley. I'm Alex Howard. And this is a podcast hosted by two legally blind guys for film lovers of all abilities. This is really exciting, Alex. This is our first podcast. Yeah, I know we've been trying to get this off the ground for almost a year now, so I'm really excited we finally are getting going. And we're so glad that you decided to come along with us on our journey. In this podcast, we plan to bring you movie reviews, film news, awards chatter, top 10 lists, and possibly a few other surprises, as well as talking about a very um, specific component, uh, which is audio description. We'll get to that in a minute, but we just kind of wanted to talk about how visually impaired people experience movies, because there's a common myth that visually impaired and blind people don't watch movies or they don't watch many movies and that's simply not true yeah i think it i think this podcast will give a good like our experience watching movies the low the low vision experience watching movies if you will so i think you know kind of an oxymoron a blind movie fan but i think um this will prove that we do enjoy movies and hopefully you know, spread awareness that way. And also, we just love talking about movies. We have phone calls all the time talking about movies. So we thought you know, you guys would like to participate in the conversation. And I think the thing that's so great about film and one of the reasons why we love it is that it's such a universally connecting um, experience for all of us. All of us can relate to going to the cinema when the lights begin to dim and the magic happens on the screen. And stories are so impactful and enlightening and entertaining that it's something we can all connect on. Yeah, and the the escape factor, too, I think helps, especially now dealing with, you know, the pandemic's on the tail end, but we're still in it. And there are wars and everything going on in the world. I think movies help people escape. And even different situations. I was watching Hustle last night on your recommendation. And there's the part where Adam Sandler says... um, you know, passion beats talent every time. And I, he was talking about basketball, but I was thinking, like, it works with movies. Like, I am, I live and breathe the entertainment industry. You know, listening to podcasts from every waking moment, when I go to bed, it's, like, always on the mind. And so I feel like, you know, the passion, that quote kind of applies to everything, not just basketball. So, you know, there are different things people can take from different movies. 100%. And speaking of the idea of passion... What movies inspired you? Um, so I think, well, when I was a kid, my my eyesight started going when I was very, very little. And um, I had a contact lenses when I was a baby. And um, so I, I actually had to patch my eye when I was in preschool. And patching is when you put a sticker over your good eye to strengthen your bad eye when your eyes are still growing. And so the only way my mom could get me to sit still with a patch since I was so little was to put me in front of the TV and watch Disney movies so we had you know those um those book VHS tapes of the Disney movies so I I grew up watching those and I slowly just developed my love for movies through that I mean I have obviously my childhood favorite movies but I think yeah I started going to the movies a lot in high school and it's just I love the hearing different stories and you know just the idea that we have thing with movies as long as humans have been around with cave drawings and comics and um shakespeare and i just i I love hearing stories and different perspectives and i feel like you know crying in movies is one of my favorite things to do if a movie can make me cry it remains one of my favorite movies ever so yeah i just i love not to get cheesy but nicole kidman you know heartbreak feels good in a place like this like i love the feelings that movies give us and the escapism but also you know the understanding that they give us with what everyone else is dealing with too yeah i totally feel you on that uh also just a side tangent for anyone who does not go to amc theaters there's this promo before every amc movie with nicole kidman and one of her most iconic lines in that is heartbreak feels good in a place like this it is cheesy, but to your point, Alex, I think it's actually um, pretty true as well. That yeah. It does feel really good to go into a theater and experience like an emotional cleansing, if you will, or just having that cathartic moment of release. It's very freeing and sometimes even healing. 
Yeah, and I know the first movie I remember going to, I think it was either Toy Story or Toy Story 2, but my mom took me to the El Capitan, and they had the characters up on the wall. The El Capitan, for people who don't know, is the the Disney theater on on Hollywood Boulevard. Disney owns it, and they always decorate and have a... um, an organ the, they have an organ which is really cool and they also do a lot of like disney movie premieres there as well yeah so i i remember going to that as a kid so obviously you know sticks out in my memory because of my love of movies and i had i mean i grew up with toy story i had all the toys and everything too but w- what about you like w- what f- what fueled your passion for the entertainment industry and movies in particular so it's funny because I feel like we can definitely we definitely connect on Disney movies because when I was younger, Disney movies were such a part of my childhood, as I'm sure they were part of most people's childhoods. The first movie that I remember really embracing was The Little Mermaid. And then it was the Disney Renaissance era. So there was like The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Lion King, and so on and so forth. And I used to watch those movies over and over and over again. And I think what those movies illuminated to me was the power of storytelling and just how imaginative and creative stories could be. So after my Disney experiences, it made me want to see what other kinds of content were out there. So, you know, I grew up watching other cartoons as well. But then some of those uh, family films like Mrs. Doubtfire or uh, those old Disney classic uh, live action movies like Davy Crockett or Old Yeller, uh, some of those were very fond movies for me. And what really kind of, I guess, boosted my uh, love of cinema was uh, Titanic, actually, because It was such an immersive experience for me when I first saw it and just seeing how all of the technical elements of cinema, which I hadn't paid attention to before, work together to really put you in the middle of the sinking ship experience. That's funny because my the movie that made me love cinema was Terminator 2, which is also James Cameron and the technical and, you know, just the creative story. So it's funny that James Cameron had that much of an impact on both of our experiences growing up and I think yeah the movies that really stuck out to me growing up were the you know kid befriends creature whether it be Air Bud or Iron Giant or E.T. or things like that really um connected with me but you know T2 was the primary one for me and it's great that Titanic was the same thing for you are you gonna go see the re-release you think I'm so excited about the re-release I will be there on the biggest and best screen which uh, for those people living in LA we all know is either the Chinese theater on Hollywood Boulevard or Universal City Walk AMC IMAX uh, which is right by the Universal uh, the Universal Studios theme park that's awesome are you gonna go see the re-release um I probably I went two or three years ago, I think, when it was re-released, and now it's being re-released again. So yeah, I mean, I if I have time, I would definitely love to get to it. What will be interesting, though, for me watching this re-release is uh, watching it with my vision in its current state. So to give everyone a little bit of background, when I was born with the eye condition glaucoma, And when I was younger, up until the middle of college, I could see pretty well, I would say. I wasn't able to read like blackboards in school or overhead projectors or anything. But watching movies, I felt like I got the full picture. I could even read subtitles on the screen and pick up little details. But in college, the vision in my right eye started to go and I lost that completely. And then right after college, the vision in my left eye started to go. And then the movie viewing experience became pretty different and definitely different phases of adjustment as the vision in my left eye has continued to decrease. What about you, Alex? I'm curious to know what you said that like, you know, you're you had to patch your eye when you were younger. But how would you describe your visual changes over the years so, and how that's affected your uh, movie watching experience? 
So subtitles have always been difficult, I think. Um, I remember even in high school we watched, um, I think it's A Beautiful Life. I oh, think that's what it that is. Life is Beautiful. Life is Beautiful, yes. Sorry. Uh, I In high school, I watched Life is Beautiful in class, and the teacher gave me a copy to bring home to watch so that I could, you know, pause it and read the subtitles. So, yeah, I, I've always had trouble with subtitles, but I think as an adult more than when I was in high school, my eyesight has become more of a barrier. So now it's harder to... Um, it's harder to enjoy the fast cutting action scenes, the the dark scenes, the like in in horror if it's you know too dark, it's definitely difficult. Um, I think the way I like to explain it is that like every time it cuts, it, I have to reorient myself of where I am in the room, and so it takes me a minute to process where I am. So I mean I'm a sucker for long takes, but I think there is a tool that we're gonna touch on that I think audio description helps a lot with all of those things that I, you know, struggle with. And I know it probably helps you too. Yeah, let's actually, now that you brought it up, why don't we just dive into audio description? So what audio description is, is it's a track on most films. There are some that don't have it, but audio description is a track on most films that narrates what's happening on screen when there are moments without dialogue. So, for example, um, if, you know, we're watching a horror movie and there's no dialogue, the audio descriptor might say, a woman comes downstairs, the room is dark, and we see a table in the middle of the room with a skull on it. Oh, yeah, she, she, yeah. And then it would, yeah, it would be like, oh, Lee picked up his cup and drank, you know, water in between us talking or, um, but yeah, I think, and I don't, I hesitate to say most movies, but I, ideally it'd be most movies, but I feel like every mainstream release nowadays, even most independent releases now come with audio description. I think where we get into the gray area is probably pre-2007. Even 2010, maybe. It, sometimes it gets hard to find movies with audio description, which studios are getting better about going through their back catalog and giving them AD, but not, you know, older movies are harder to find. But, uh, like, we're going to get into all of this more later in, in other episodes about does it have AD, what doesn't, what needs it, what should. Uh, this will be a regular movie podcast, but also, you know, it's our experience. And I feel like audio description plays a huge part in our enjoyment of movies. It definitely does. And um, in terms of audio description uh, for future, for the future, just know that we're going to reference audio description as AD. So when you hear us use the term AD, that's what it stands for uh, is audio description. But yeah, I think you're right, Alex, that um, it definitely, I should have, I should have like, to restate my point, all mainstream movie releases have audio description nowadays. And if you're watching a streaming service at home like Hulu or Netflix or Disney Plus, Prime Video, most of those streaming services, uh, most of their content on those services also have audio description. So if you're a sighted viewer and you've never used audio description and you're curious to know what that is, you can just go on to one of those streaming services and go to the audio subtitles menu and you'll see on the audio section, you'll see one that says English audio description. So if you're curious, you should just take a moment and go turn it on and you can experience movies in a similar way to the way that we experience movies. And then if you're uh, putting in a Blu-ray let's say, or a 4K, you can go to the audio subtitles menu and most mainstream releases, once again, on disc will have an audio, English audio description option. And then going to theaters is a totally different experience. Uh, why don't you talk about how audio description works in a movie theater? Yeah, so um, usually you, you you go to guest services and ask well it'll say when you buy the ticket if it has it or not um you like we said most mainstream ones should have it 
but you you know go to guest services and ask for an audio description device and they'll they basically they give you a little box with headphones or at amc it's a box i think at other theater chains it's like they give you just headphones that it's built into and it, i think it's like a bluetooth kind of thing with the projector so it syncs up and you can sit in the theater like everybody else and just have headphones on and listen to the audio description track what gets frustrating is um what gets frustrating is that um, sometimes they'll get it mixed up because they have a hearing impaired track as well and that just makes the audio of the movie louder so if you get the wrong one or if it just doesn't work at all you have to run out and change it out and you don't know if it's working or not until the movie starts so you have to pretty much miss the first couple minutes of the movie run out switch it out come back but I, AMC lately, they've been really good about it. I haven't had to run out in a bit. Yeah, AMC uh, specifically, since that's, those are the theater chains that me and Alex go to primarily. The AMC and Burbank is where I usually go. And I go to I go to the AMC in Burbank, and then I go to the AMC in Glendale as well. But they've done a lot better lately at programming. Um, the audio description boxes on the right channel. Yeah, I haven't had to run out for a while either, which has been pretty nice. Um, this is a whole nother topic for another podcast of frustrations with, you know, movie going experiences, but I guess it kind of gives you a brief overview of how audio description works in um, a movie theater. And then for you, Alex, how does audio description enhance your movie-going experience or movie-watching experience if you're watching something at home? So audio description, I mean, it'll read the subtitles. It'll read the um, if someone's texting, if they're looking at something on the computer. It'll read all of that text, which it helps me immensely. But it also, when there are different things in the background or especially action scenes, fast cutting action scenes like in superhero movies and John Wick and things like that. It'll describe the action really well of like, you know, grab his arm, fire the gun. Like literally it describes the choreography that's happening in the scene as well as, I mean, I'm a big horror fan. So it describes all of the dark scenes in horror. And I really like when they get into all the gore and stuff and, you know, they have to describe all that's really great. We saw, we went and saw Jackass Forever this year with audio description. That was amazing. They yeah, they did a very good job stuff. with that. Yeah. Yeah. But um, how, how does it help you? What's the most helpful thing about it for you? So in addition to everything you're saying, which I totally agree with, it helps, especially with fight choreography and action movies. That's extremely helpful because it's so quick. And sometimes I don't catch everything. It also is very helpful with locations because it'll be like at so-and-so's apartment or at the office. If I didn't have audio description, it leaves me kind of guessing and I can infer, okay, this takes place at so-and-so's apartment. But there have been times where I thought a scene was taking place at one location and then finding out it was at another location when I wasn't watching a movie with audio description. The other really helpful component of audio description for me is they say the characters' names multiple times in their audio description script. And sometimes there's a lot of characters in movies like Triangle of Sadness or Glass Onion are two examples that come to mind right away. And it really helps me keep track of the characters and to know their names because they keep repeating them when they're on screen. I mean, even like, you know, sighted viewers that I go to movies with sometimes are like, wait, what was that character's name? And I'm like, oh, it's this, because the audio description kept reinforcing that in my mind. And it also helps keep track of like the time jumps. If there is a time jump or there's a flashback, just sequentially or chronologically, it helps me keep track of the time that things are taking place in. Yeah, I would completely agree with that. I think uh, Women Talking is another one that a lot of characters... Dunkirk was... Uh, I, I don't even think I've seen that with audio description, but I remember being very confused when I watched that because all the soldiers look the same and their time jumps. So it definitely helps out with... When there's a big cast of characters, it helps you keep track of who's who, especially when you're low vision like us and you know five or six white guys... like 
Dunkirk, you're like, wait, is this that one or is this the other one? So it, it gets to be a bit difficult. Yeah, I'm really glad I watched Dunkirk for my first time with audio description. Because when the movie first came out, I wasn't using audio description at that time. And I didn't see it in theaters. So I rented it from Redbox one day and watched it with audio description. And I was like, I'm so glad that I did it this way. But in terms of um, your journey with audio description, when did you start using audio description and what prompted that for you? At first, I think I found it a bit annoying. I mean, I know I watch it with my roommate now all the time. You know, even sighted people I find enjoy it because it helps them, you know, keep track of things also. My um, my girlfriend was saying that she watched CODA with her family with AD because of the subtitles. It just got easier with it. But um, anyway, I think I started using it maybe 2018 or so. It's funny because I used to work at AMC and I didn't even use it then when I was working there. And I really started using it for every single movie after I worked at AMC because I just found that like it just get, it's easier for me. It's like I don't have to worry about, oh, is there going to be an action scene? Is there going to be something I need it for? And even women talking, there's not much action, but it, it helps keep track of the characters. And so, I mean, something like before sunrise, before sunset, that's something you don't really need it for. But really, it's pretty rare that there's a movie that it wouldn't help me to have an AD track now. So, I mean, movies that don't have it kind of deter me at this point. Um, what about you? What's your? When did you start using it? Yeah, I feel like our journeys are pretty similar because I started using uh, AD in late 2017, I think. And before that, there were people that suggested using audio description to me, uh, whether it was an employee at a theater that asked if I wanted an audio descriptive device or friends that I know that told me that audio description exists. But I think I was just, I think I was in a similar place to you where I felt like it seemed really annoying to have a voice in my ear through the whole movie. And I thought it was going to be more disruptive than helpful. And another reason I think I was adverse to using AD was because I wanted to blend in and be part of the mainstream crowd. And for whatever reason, I thought that using AD was going to put me in a different category. And I was worried about people's perceptions and all of that. So that was definitely a component as well. But once I decided to give it a try just to see what it was like in late 2017... I realized how helpful it was and I realized that there would have been a lot of things in a movie that I would miss if I didn't have audio description. So then I started using it more regularly and just got used to it. And now, just like you said, it's really hard for me to watch a movie without any audio descriptive track. And it will deter me somewhat from doing that. Yeah, I feel I always feel like I'm missing something. Like in the background, or when they're walking around, because there there are several times with the AD where I don't, you don't expect it to give you a, a clue about something, and then for it to pay off later. And so when when a movie doesn't have it, you know, I, and I feel like it really, you talked about like, what was the wording you used? Like not being normal. You said um, just not being part of like the mainstream movie going crowd. Yeah. And feeling like in some way that was going to make me less than or there would people would have a different perception of me when I walk in with like that audio device. Yeah, I feel like it almost helps us be part of the mainstream because we don't have to ask as many questions. You know, it, it helps us be more of a part of the conversation because we it helps us know what's going on in a movie. So. Yeah, um, I totally agree. One of the things that's also been really fun, and we'll probably do some reviews or some commentary on this later in a future episode, is when you go back and you watch a movie that you've seen before that you didn't watch with audio description, then you watch it with audio description and realize the little details of things that you might have missed. Oh, yeah. Can you think of one? Because I can think of one. 
Uh, what's yours? I'm I'm thinking right now. So <laughs> Pirates Two on Disney Plus has audio description. So I grew up with the Pirates movies. You know, one and two are awesome. Kind of falls off a little after that. Kind of a lot after that. <laughs> but um, Pirates Two in the beginning when they're on the island and they're in the cages and he, I think. He says, these cages weren't built till after we got here. And I always thought that meant, oh, the, uh, the other crew fell down into the, into the crevice and died because they didn't build them well. But then the audio description said that the cages were built out of bones. And I was like, oh, the cages are built out of the crew with the bones of them. And it changed the whole like perception of the scene, you know? Totally, totally. I guess the one that comes to mind, this is probably not the best example because there's not a ton of audio description, would be uh, the 2012 version of Les Miserables because I knew the material for that movie because I'm a big musical fan going into it. But when I watched it later with audio description, there were just little details about things that were happening in the background that I was like, oh, I totally missed that. And even though I knew the story and I knew the music backwards and forwards, how Tom Hooper decided to depict it visually, I picked up on a lot of little details, nothing major and nothing that really changed the scope of the story for me, but it was kind of fascinating to have little details filled in. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, Les Mis Rob, do you want to, I think this podcast will be really interesting because you come from more of a theater background and I come from a, you know, sort of screen background, if you will. But do you want to talk real quick about your uh, background a little bit? Yeah. Uh, so my background, I grew up doing community theater and uh, school theater, both in elementary school, middle school, and high school. And live theater, uh, stories on stage, has always been a huge passion of mine. And then I went on to college and got my bachelor's degree in theater um, and directing and performance. And after I graduated, I pursued a lot of I pursued a lot of theater related things such as directing and acting, although now I'm also pursuing acting for TV and film. But, yeah, it's interesting because I come from a very theatrical background, so. Movies based on plays, I love those, generally speaking, and movie musicals I'm also a very big fan of as well. I'd say that those are probably my favorite genres. And then, um, yeah, your favorite genre, Alex, is horror, right? There's so many feelings that go into horror, I think that's what it is, that it it, it just appeals to me so much, and it, more so than I think some of the more quote-unquote real, you know, um, situations. I feel like there's a lot of real stuff happening in my own life that I, I much prefer the, the things that aren't necessarily as realistic that could happen to me. Does that make sense? That does make sense. And it's so interesting because though we come from different genres that are our favorites, I understand where you're coming from as far as like there's so many things that happen in real life that for you, horror gives you an escape into a world that kind of has a heightened reality that kind of takes you away from just the woes and struggles of real life things. And for me, um, you know, mu movie musicals are that for me, where it takes me away from thinking about real life or, you know, just like depressing um, moments of life because we all have those. But it brings me to a place where I can forget about those things for a while. And it, I guess it's not necessarily those things in musicals could never happen to me. But more so I'm like, oh, I wish those things would happen to me. I wish that we could all spontaneously break out into song and dance. And that would be really great. Yeah. And I, I feel like what's cool is, I mean, you and I can, I can definitely appreciate the musical genre. I mean, La La Land was my f favorite movie of the year when that came out. Um, I feel like we, we both can appreciate all kinds of film. Like, I mean, superhero movies, big blockbusters, but also like really small, you know, A24 movies. I feel like we, we have a big range of things we enjoy. And so I feel like we can have some great conversation. 
Yeah, I'm really excited to be discussing movies with you in that way because we both have a wide net of movies that we enjoy and we like all genres, but we also have differences of opinions on certain movies, so it'll be fun to do like reviews where we may disagree on something and to talk about that and to see where our perspectives are different. So yeah, I'm super excited about that. Yeah, and I think if you all want to participate in the conversation as well, um, you can email us. Um, would you like to give them the email, Lee? Yeah, uh, you can email us at darkroomfilmcast at gmail.com. Once again, that's darkroomfilmcast at gmail.com. And to reiterate, we would love to hear from you, and we would love to know the topics that you're interested in us talking about, topics that you would find potentially educational, enlightening, or just fun. You know, we're open to all possibilities, and any suggestions that we get, we definitely want to try to implement those into our podcast episodes. Yeah, and like cited or unsighted, if you have any questions about our eyesight, if you have any questions about movies because that's what this podcast is about um feel free to email us and we would love to hear from you and no question as far as i'm concerned is off limits so don't if you're a sighted listener out there and there's a question that you want to ask but you're not sure if you should ask it by all means feel free to ask it me and alex aren't people that are easily offended and we also want to give people an opportunity to learn along with us because we're still learning as well. And we know that in an ideal world, everyone is a lifelong learner. So we want to create that opportunity. We want to create the opportunity for dialogue and conversation to happen to get a deeper understanding on all sides of the sighted world and the blind and low vision world as well. Yeah, I am... I think we're both open to being very vulnerable and honest and raw. So, yeah, um, we're just here to talk about our experience and our love of movies. So, literally, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Yeah, once again, uh, thank you guys so much for listening to our very first episode. It's so great to have you guys here. And we look forward to many more to come. Yeah, and we will talk to you guys later. All right, take care.